Uh, thank you very much, Shana, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, in uh, contrast to the to the other speakers, uh, my my talk will be a very simple one, but it's raising a point that I find very important in the context of uh, looking at alternative methods. Um, I should say before I pour some water into the wine that I'm a big, big fan of uh, uh, in vitro and alternative methods of uh, computer modeling. And uh, I loved the presentations of this afternoon quite a lot. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, I was starting with animal experimentation. So I was looking at uh, regulation of phase two enzymes by uh, application of xenobiotics. And after the PhD, I decided that animal experimentation is really tough business and I would like to go for alternative approaches. I went into molecular biology, which I found a very nice tool to do many things in vitro that would be much more cumbersome in, uh, from the animal experimentation side. But uh, then after that, at some point, returned to what Chana was uh, referring to regulatory business uh, as a site um, profession of mine. And uh, there is, of course, uh, a great progress in in vitro and modeling uh, research, but I think we're not yet there. So the, the title that Shana suggested is a little bit, uh, um, I'm say, modulated by myself. The, the question I, I would like to place is, are we close to abundant animal experimentation? And there's a very, very simple reason to ask this question, because the public thinks yes. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, I picked up this article from the famous 20 minutes, uh, the, uh, the freely available kind of news in Switzerland. And they were telling uh, good news, Corona uh, might end the era of animal research or experimentation. And they were, uh, they were citing a famous scientist that you probably all know, uh, Thomas Hartung, uh, the director of the CAAT at the Johns Hopkins University, who is sometimes a little bit over enthusiastic on the present state of uh, uh, in vitro versus in vivo um, research in my view. So it's my, all my personal view, I have to, I have to add. Um, uh, 10 years ago, he was, uh, publishing this article in Nature, for instance, where he was citing uh, a study that uh, was also put up by Francois uh, that was actually published by Olson. This is one of the papers of, of his uh, consortium where they were looking at the predictivity of uh, animal uh, data for the human toxicities. While Thomas Hartung says, well, only 43% of the toxic effects in humans were correctly predicted by rodents and 63 by non-rodent animals and found that uh, particularly sad. Like Francois also comes to a bit of a different assessment. Yeah, so they're pointing out the same numbers and maybe the dice, I liked it a lot, Francois, uh, is a good, uh, is, is, a, is a fair model to, to, to rate on these data. But on top, you have to appreciate that uh, the majority uh, of candidates that failed in animal experimentation are not included in this data set. So two thirds of this data set are actually approved drugs and another third is drugs that failed in the human trials. So anything that has already been popped up being particularly toxic in the rodent or other animal data was excluded from this data set. So in that sense, these data are not so bad. Um, but come, coming back to this newspaper, what is the consequence of such um, a, a public announcement that uh, uh, like it says in this article, we are too slow based on animal experimentation and we need uh, in vitro models with even better predictivity in order to speed up our um, medical drug development. If those articles appear and it makes the impression that animal uh, experimentation is not useful for these purposes, then we are faced with problems like this. This is the present uh, public initiative that is aiming for a complete ban of animal and human experimentation in Switzerland. So it's at the moment um, 
at the level of the Bundesrat. And this is what it says. Um, it suggests to really ban any type of animal experimentation and also human experimentation. And uh, um, on top, the um, import and uh, selling of any products that are derived from animal experimentation elsewhere. You, all of you know that what that would mean. So then are no new drugs approved simply because at the moment we cannot abandon animal research. The risk management or risk assessment and management uh, that we all are used to do is based on hazard identification, exposure assessment, dose response assessment, and the, I would say still the majority of data uh, for, for these purposes are coming from in vivo studies. There is a good progress in in vitro and in in silico and in modeling, but still a major basis are the in vivo studies. Um, let's get back for a second to Thomas Hartung. I, th I think uh, uh, Nicole Kleinstreu has already very well introduced the TOX21 and I'm, I can briefly go over it. It's a, it's a huge effort to produce in vitro data um, based on um, automated assays. Um, on, the, on the website of the, of the TOXCast, you find that they are presently uh, having around 350s up and running. Maybe, I think there are even more. Um, they are based on, many of them are based on, um, uh, on cells. The majority of those on human cells, which is nice for the predictivity for the humans. Um, essay design is different. I, I'm, I'm going through that rapidly, but I still should show you that despite the fact that it's kind of small living systems, it's a limited number of cells. And we all know that there are, I would say, even thousand different, thousands of different cell types in a living organism, a complex living organism of a mammal. And this is unfortunately just given a fraction therefore. Still the amount that they put in is a lot. So you can look at all these in vitro as and just the documentation of these in vitro test methods takes 11,000 pages. And the outcome we have already heard a little bit about it is uh, like you are contributing to the predictivity. Here we see that uh, as already mentioned by Nicole, um, the estrogen receptor activity assays are now accepted as an alternative test in the EDSP tire one, which means um, it's suggesting estrogenic activity. And so further studies are required in order to prove or disprove this. So there's a lot of work ongoing, fascinating data, nicely accessible, but uh, if you think of usefulness for prediction, there are some caveats that we should keep in mind. So one important barrier that is, I think, obvious to every one of us is the complexity of tissue architecture and cell-cell interactions. So it's a, admittedly a mean example, but if we look at the central nervous system, so this is a sagittal, a cut through a mouse, uh, uh, yeah, it's a mouse brain actually. Um, the structure I'm interested in is the hippocampus here, yeah, but there's a lot more known about specific little regions with specific functions. But if you now look just at the hippocampal formation and look at uh, the knowledge 100 years ago when Kajal was. Um, um, visualizing interconnectivity between neurons on a very, from our today's standards, on a very primitive base, you already realized that the interaction between the individual cells in the hippocampal formation are fascinating, highly complex, and this is just going to simplify this even. So the interconnectivity that you have, so, so there's, for instance, from here from the uh, from the CA3 region, the axons are reaching out into the 
field of the dendrites of the CA1 neurons. And there we have an interaction which is um, nicely simple as compared to many other inter, uh, interconnections in the, in the central nervous system. And remember, each neuron has interconnections to around another thousand other neurons. So the complexity here is enormous. And it's not just the central nervous system. Uh, if you look at the kidney, uh, uh, all possibly a bit simpler. We have the functional uh, unit, the, uh, the nephron, and here is depicted the, the, uh, the, the cellular structure of the uh, Bauman's capsule or the glomerulus. We have the filtration unit, then you're getting into the proximal tube. You all know this. But what is the in vitro representation of this in our present in vitro systems? One buzzword that often comes up is organ on a chip. The organs on a chip for the kidney, if you look it up, yeah, kidney on a chip, you find that you often find representation of structures that try to uh, approximate the glomerulus or even more often the proximal tubule, but the whole nephron I haven't seen on a chip so far, neither, not speaking about the whole kidney. So in that sense, we only look at small entities. And at the end of the day, when we have all these assays together, we might have the puzzle complete, but certainly we are not there yet. Um, from the toxicological perspective, what makes it a bit complicated if we are asking for effects of compounds. Occasionally, we require several compartments to work together to replicate the toxicity of a given compound. A typical example would be MPTP, this neurotoxic agent that produces Parkinson-like uh, problems in, in patients. The MPTP after in the neutral state, after crossing the blood-brain barrier, needs to be activated to the active charged molecule MPP plus the metabolite. And this activation goes on by monoamine oxidase of the B-type, preferentially in glial cells, and then becomes a substrate for the dopamine transporter to enter dopaminergic neurons to mess up uh, physiology in the mitochondria of these target cells. If we combine these two cells in a dish, definitely we can re uh, recapitulate the toxicity. But how many different cell types do we need to combine on a dish in order to cover all the whole picture that is potentially producing problems? Or another example, a very simple one, um, I admit, is carbon monoxide. As we all know, carbon monoxide interferes with the transport capacity of hemoglobin for oxygen. We place it it's, uh, quite strongly. And therefore, uh, in the whole organism that depends uh, on blood perfusion for the oxygen supply, it's a deadly toxin. If you put that into a cell culture dish, you will hardly experience the same effect simply because cells and culture receive the oxygen not via hemoglobin transport, but simply via diffusion. So this is just two very simple examples to exemplify that uh, peculiarities in the toxic, uh, toxicological profile of compounds are not necessarily easy to recapitulate in vitro. Um, for that reason, the prerequisite uh, that is uh, identified by authorities for first in men studies mandatorily still asks for animal pharmacology and toxicology stu studies. As I, uh, Chana has mentioned that I'm uh, supporting uh, uh, the, uh, the drug um, admission here in Switzerland by being member of this HAMEC. I'm one of the two who is responsible for contributing to the discussion on preclinical data. And I give you my uh, personal view on where in these preclinical studies we are still strictly depending on in vivo and where we may already be uh, good with in, in vitro or where, and that's fair, fair to state, in vitro can support in vivo data. Well, this is pretty easy. Mode of action is something if we have identified a molecular target that we can definitely do in the first place in vitro. There we don't need in vivo. 
in order to identify whether a particular receptor is blocked or um, activated by a, a given drug candidate. However, if we go to the proof of concept, we need an animal study. So if you want to, to see whether an antineoplastic agent is really reducing tumor size, uh, we can do a little bit in, uh, in the culture dish, but we need to know whether in the physiological uh, context, this also works well. And therefore, I would say there's little support for the proof of concept by in vitro data. Secondary ph pharmacodynamics, looking whether other um, off targets are hit by the molecule. This is something where you can nicely do high throughput screening, screening approaches. And there I would say in vitro is stronger than in vivo, but on the safety pharmacology base where we would like to see whether in a complex setting, circular, uh, cardiovascular effects occur, breathing is somehow uh, attacked, neurological symptoms come up there, we definitely no, need again a whole animal to have a look at it. It can be supported by in vitro data in order to identify whether, for instance, say in the cardiovascular system, the HERC uh, is a major target. There it helps, but a, a lot of things are simply not well covered by in vitro data. When it comes to pharmacokinetics, absorption is some something that is only be finally assessed in the given species. The differences between humans and animals. So we need to have both animal experimentation and the clinical data in the end. And it can be supported by in vitro data. There are barrier models for, uh, uh, for the gastrointestinal tract, but they stand alone. They are not sufficient to, uh, to allow decision. Distribution is almost the same. So we can, in vitro check for plasma protein binding, but the real distribution in an organism is driven by so many factors, including the complex expression pattern of transporters in tissues. This is something where we will have uh, a long way to go to recapitulate it in, in vitro. Metabolism can be assessed initially in cells, hepatocytes, for instance, but the final pattern, we still rely on animal experimentation and excretion is something where the predictivity in my view is difficult. For the toxicology, of course, there are nice in vitro models that are not supported by in vivo, but uh, yeah, HERC aims uh, the, the um, skin sensitization. These are typical examples where I would say uh, in vitro is pretty pretty much advanced, but acute toxicity is something where we could guess, but need animal data. The same applies to subchronic toxicity. Developmental toxicity and fertility are heavily depending on animal data. Well, and carcinogenicity, I would say, is a problem because the predictivity of the test, even in animals, is poor. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something where in vitro data are not sufficiently advanced in my view. And uh, coming back to this article, there was the claim that uh, the corona era is now giving proof that we can abandon animal experimentation. If that's written in a newspaper, is that true? Well, let's have a look at the reality. Um, let's first look at a small molecule remdesivir, which has been promoted for uh, being a a potential cure against uh, COVID-19. It has admittedly been um, granted uh, a um, conditional approval in Switzerland simply because in clinical trials, it reduced uh, the hospitalization phase. But if you look at all the drugs that have in vitro being kind of promising in terms of reducing mortality, remdesivir doesn't do it. This is the um, um, solidarity study from the WHO, the data, sorry for not giving that here. Hydrochloroquine is even worse. 
or interferon doesn't help. Lopinavir may have a tiny effect. So this is the outcome of the data that have on based on in vitro uh, models been suggested. And then we have the vaccines. And you may think, well, messenger RNA vaccine, no animal studies uh, needed. That's not true. So both messenger RNA vaccines have uh, had a plethora of animal models to prove um, the concept and the efficacy. So this is two examples that I took from a publicly available publication. Usually, as uh, Francois pointed out, many of the, uh, the preclinical data are not published. This one is, that's why I can present it here. There are much better data that are not published that I would have liked to show you, but uh, uh, they are not available. But this is just to prove that also these vaccines have undergone uh, quite rigorous animal experimentation trials in order to be, um, in the end, a, able to be um, approved. So at the moment, this is a very trivial scheme. I think uh, drug development still starts from biochemical analysis and silico data, high throughput screening assays to then go to the more sophisticated cell culture models, possibly to organs on a chip, which all are meant to protect poor animals from testing the wrong candidates. If we have something that comes out favorable from these studies, then we can go to the animals, which we need, go to clinical trials and later to the approved drug. And in the end, I would say, presently in vitro studies contribute substantially, but uh, a meaningful toxicological risk assessment, in my view, is impossible in the absence of in vivo data. Um, perspectively, these in vitro systems can reduce animal experimentation to some extent, maybe completely at some day. I don't see that perfectly. At the moment, this complete replacement is not in sight. And therefore, I think, I think in particular in view of this potentially public vote that might come at some point, it's important that we are not being so enthusiastic about uh, the development of our in vitro system claim that there's already superior because that's putting us into the danger that uh, uh, the public will believe that animal experimentation can be abundant. And I don't think that this is presently the case. So sorry for being so political today, but I think it's important to have an eye on that because um, four years ago, I wouldn't have bet that uh, um, the American public would have voted in the direction they did. And nowadays we cannot exclude that our public is uh, uh, in the majority in favor of something that we all believe is essential. Thanks for your attention. I'm happy to entertain questions or try to comment to comments. <laughs> Thanks a lot.